you can see that at the bottom of your screen with the CC button, um, you can enable that feature if that suits you. As I mentioned, we'll work our way through some presentations and the pre-submitted questions, and then we'll go to your live question. So at the bottom of uh, your screen, you've got the Q&A option. Please use the Q&A option to submit any questions you can. We're not um, using the raise hand feature. There will also be a lot of activity in the chat as we go. We've got some staff on the back end who are going to be including links that are referenced and other important uh, elements or resources that you can access. So pay attention to that uh, chat and take some screen grabs as we go. All of what we are talking about today is captured in our winter term FAQ website and we'll include that in the chat. And so don't be afraid to um, take some time to go reference that in the coming days or after today's presentation and certainly throughout the term. So with all of that said, I would like to now welcome Laurier's President and Vice Chancellor, Dr. Deborah McClatchy to say a few words. Thank you very much, Kate. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I want to begin by recognizing all of our graduate students who are here today for your commitment to your academic studies and to your research and scholarly activities. Being a graduate student during a global pandemic has not been easy. And I know that many of you had, have had to shift ex expectations and balance many challenges and competing priorities. I recognize as well that many of you are an important part of the learning endeavors of our undergraduate students as teaching assistants and instructors. And I acknowledge this has been a challenging time with the disruption caused by the Omicron variant. And while some of you are already on campus and some of you are excited to return to our campuses, there is also much trepidation. This is a significant transition. For some of you, it will be your first time on campus. I know that there will be challenges with this transition. Please know that the staff and faculty at Laurier are here to support you through this adjustment. The health and wellness of our community is the priority. At the same time, building back our vibrant campus community is also important. Our plans for a phased and gradual return have the support of both Waterloo Region Public Health and the Brant County Health Unit and are in line with other post-secondary institutions across the province. Returning to in-person activities is important for Laurier. A university is a community of people working together to create and disseminate knowledge and exchange ideas. It supports the holistic development of our students, undergraduate and graduate. I am confident that during this transition, we will support each other and be mindful of our shared responsibility in creating a safe return to campus. Thank you again for coming today to share your thoughts, concerns, and to ask questions. I do want to let you know that I'll be leaving the town hall at 2.30 to introduce the speaker in today's installment of the biology seminar series, an important part of the department's graduate program. I will now turn the mic over to Dr. Vanelli, provost and VP academic, who will begin sharing our plans about return to campus this term. Thank you, Deb. And I'm going to have the uh, Dean of the Faculty of Graduate and Postdoctoral Stu Studies, Douglas Deutschman, present this. Douglas, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, starting off, I, I have a word cloud that I prepared from some of your uh, submitted questions. And you'll notice that there's a, a lot of words you'll hear throughout this talk uh, about safety and about access and about things like how do we eat on campus and, and who's vulnerable. So those questions are very important to us. We'll be addressing them as we go. Next slide, please. So as uh, Dr. McClatchy was saying, Laurier has a long tradition of in-person community with a mission of teaching and learning. For grad students, of course, research and scholarship and community engagement is incredibly important. This is what makes us Laurier. This is what graduate studies and graduate students really um, are about. So I'm excited that we have the, pos the, the ability to, to return to in-person um, activities. The health and safety of the community though remains a priority and so you need to understand that we've worked very hard um, with uh, the local public health units to develop a plan that is safe minimizes risk and allows the, the maximum benefit in terms of in-person activities 
And as was said before, the, the campus plans are supported by the Waterloo Region Public Health and the Brant County Health Unit. Uh, next slide, please. So what you're looking at in this graph is the our four phase uh, return process. The first phase starts next Monday on the 31st. Um, in the bar chart, it's the, the blue at the bottom. It represents about 25% of our sections. And the average size of those sections is about 22 students. So they will be smaller classes that where it's easier to maintain safety protocols um, than in larger classes. Phase two starts a week later on the 7th. The average class size of the classes coming in person at that point is, um, is 40. That's about 50% of our um, sections. Phase three and four are slated for February 14th and 28th. Um, they each represent about 10% of our sections and those are the larger classes with an average class size of 128 and 174. Um, looking at the materials that you'll, you can find on our website, some graduate person graduate classes resume in-person activities during phase one, starting Monday, and others start in phase two. But um, I believe all graduate programs have restart, restarted um, in-person activities by phase two. And if, if you're a graduate teaching assistant, make sure that you coordinate with your lab instructor or your course supervisor to make sure that you're on the same page with uh, that course as well. And next slide, please. There are a lot of resources on our website for, for all of us. I wanted to remind you that the students.wlu.ca site is a great place to start. It has um, right on the splash page, some links to information about our phased return. Um, it's very important for all of us that we are um, paying attention to safety and wellness. And so there's links that address some of the uh, issues that COVID-19 has created for all of us. And I also wanted to acknowledge the Graduate Student Association and their role in trying to provide a um, health, healthy and safe environment for graduate students and being our partner in this. And they've just released a statement that I received only a few minutes before um, this um, webinar. And I appreciate um, very much the, the, the care and the thought they put into that statement about the need for um, accommodations in some cases and to be very thoughtful about safety um, when we move forward into in-person. Next slide. Okay, I believe at this point we hand it over to Ivan. Is that correct? Thanks, Doug. I'll take it from here. Hey, folks, how are you? I know there's lots of questions. We've heard um, from lots of folks um, through emails, through phone calls, uh, through the uh, through the metaverse and Twitter, um, while some students and their families are nervous about coming to school, coming back to school, some are excited about coming back to school. Uh, we know that there's not, um, you know, a, a blanket approach to how we are approaching this, but we are doing it in this way in that we are we are making sure that we're keeping the health and safety of our campus community at the forefront of all our decisions. Graduate students have some unique challenges and, and the way we approach them is different than how we approach our undergraduate students. We're ready to acknowledge that and, and, and are listening and are paying attention to your feedback as we move forward. We recognize that with over 2000 undergrad graduate students, we can't make everybody happy with every single decision that we do make. Um, but we will try our best to hear your feedback and do what's in the best interest of students and the institution as we move forward. Next slide, please. One of the things I want you to be aware of is what is exactly happening and what can you expect on campus? And to answer those questions, we've created a simple little chart. You know, hybrid is when there's a mix of, of in-person and virtual. Virtual is straight virtual and, and clearly in-person is when you'll have boots on the ground here on our campuses. And the athletic centers on both campuses, both on the Waterloo campus and the YMCA campus, will we'll be, we'll be delivering both hybrid um, we'll be delivering hybrid services, meeting both in person online. So while you might have intramurals in person, you might have a Zumba class or a group fitness class online. The, the pools will be open. The weight rooms will be open again um, at 50 percent capacity, um, wearing, um, maintaining social distancing and following the health and safety protocols. Food services will be delivered in the various places on campus, and Dan will go specifically into those spaces, but the Terrace Food Court, Starbucks, Golden Grounds, Coffee, Fresh Co. Veritas, um, that's for in-person dining and, again, following the guidelines. 
um, as presented by public health. Campus services, where you get your one card, your bookstore, your study spaces, the Dean of Students, Laurier Leaders to Leaders program, those services will be running on campus in person. Next slide, please. When we're looking, how, does, how can we support the academic um, academics of our students? Accessible learning, the accommodation center, we're delivering our services in a hybrid approach. In fact, as early as Monday, we will be monitoring and um, exams and accommodating folks that for in-person exams, the writing center, math and statistics, study skills workshop, experiential learning career development. I know folks will have questions about uh, meeting in those spaces and, and what that might look like. If your space is too small to meet, um, with, with an academic accommodations um, advisor, then we will move that to a bigger meeting room. And if we can't move it to a meeting, big, bigger meeting room, then it will be delivered online um, in the virtual world. And that's what we mean by the hybrid approach. Next slide, please. When we're looking at how we support your, your mental health and well being, recognize the deans of students are available in a hybrid for, approach. Laurier International students, as we welcome students here, again, delivering their services in a hybrid approach. The student health and wellness centers, they're programming their workshops, again, in, in a uh, hybrid approach. The Center for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, because they've got events and programming, which as much of their activity, they will be virtual. But we, know, we want students to return to campus and know that they can still have access and when it says hybrid or, you know, make sure that um, there will still be boots on the ground here. Folks will be in their offices and the campus will be full of our, our student services staff. Next slide, please. You know, one of the things we've heard from folks right now is, uh, um, you know, is it safe to come back? Recognize that we're, we're doing all we can. Dan will go into those details about the vaccine processes and all the all the things that we're doing to ensure that the safe and, 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 and healthy return to our campus. We want you to know, make sure you know, as you are graduate students, that might have different challenges. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what we're hearing from all our students is that they all want to be connected. They want, to, they want a sense of community and they're committed to following through with their academic pursuits. And so we're here to help you do that in however way we can. And so ask your questions, we're here to answer them. And we look forward to the town hall and getting everybody back up and running as soon as possible. Over to you, Dan. Thanks, Ivan. Um, as we go into this next se section, we're going to focus on some of the physical aspects of the campus and our health and safety. So next slide, please. With rapid at antigen test kits and their availability, we have ordered a five pack uh, rapid test kits through a parental ordering system. We Our order has been accepted and processed, although we don't have an exact delivery date for these yet, but we are under the impression that they will be coming within the next week or so. Um, the priority for those test kits in the broader community has been for, focused on healthcare, long-term care, and the K-12 sector, but the provincial government uh, portal representative met, sent us a message as recent as yesterday afternoon and said that they are now moving to complete and fulfill the orders for the post-secondary market. Um, many of you are in roles that relate to employment operating as TAs, et cetera. And there are another um, style of rapid test kits that are being made available to all people in an employment relationship. And those are 25 pack rapid test kits. And those are being uh, distributed as we speak uh, to departments that are returning as early as next week. Next slide, please. The face covering policy um, is something that has received a lot of conversation and uh, comments about. And our policy has not been updated or changed in any way. Um, it is consistent with what we've had over the last number of months and is totally in line with public health advice. However, having said that, it is important that all people attending the campus focus on a mask that has the best fit and filtration possible. This may include non-medical and, and medical grade masks. It is strongly advised that a medical grade mask be worn or a medical grade mask in combination with a cloth mask is also something that could be, could be acceptable. Laurier is not changing the policy requiring N95 masks. However, we recognize that um, it is important to, rec to appreciate that that is the best source of protection for both the individual and those around you. 
We are also making N95 masks available uh, through two vending machines on the Waterloo campus with the My Little Health Mart network, as well as making them available on a cost recovery basis at our campus bookstores. Next slide, please. All individuals are required to wear a mask while they're in any of our common areas in inside buildings, classrooms, laboratories, et cetera. The medical N95 and N medical grade masks, as I described, will be made available. Um, and I know that both our uh, student governments are interested in providing support for that as well. Faculty are permitted to remove their masks at their discretion while they're instructing, as long as they can maintain two meter distancing, but it is strongly recommended that they keep their mask on as much as possible in the teaching environment. Next slide, please. With our mandatory vaccination policy, we're pleased to report that we've got 99% compliance with vaccination across all of our areas, both student and employees. And at this time, there is no, change, no plan to change the definition of fully vaccinated to include the booster. We will continue to follow advice from public health. Um, and if the uh, mandate changes from the provincial government, then we will adapt to that when that happens. We strongly encourage all staff, faculty, and students to get their booster as soon as possible. And there are many opportunities in the local areas around our two campuses where uh, clinics are available and some in person on same day appointment basis. And we will continue to monitor this as the uh, situation evolves. Next, next slide. With case management, there's been a significant change since the fall semester with respect to this. Public health had been providing case management support, but they are now only doing that for areas that are determined to be high risk settings. And post-secondary education is not considered a high risk setting due to the fact that all of our members attending our campuses have been fully vaccinated and we have such strong policies in place to support it. Employees and students must continue to do their daily self-assessment through the SafeHawk app and they cannot attend a physical campus if they receive a red badge. If anybody is experiencing symptoms related to COVID-19, they should isolate for at least five days. And if they do have any symptoms or they've been a close contact, that is also something that would require them to isolate and they should not return in person to a campus until 24 hours after they have been free of any of those symptoms. Next slide, please. There has also been a lot of questions put forward about uh, ventilation across our campuses. Air filtration systems have been upgraded over the past year, and those have included filter upgrades as well as increased fresh air exchange rates. A third party organization was retained uh, to come in late in the fall semester and into January to test the accuracy of our air circulation in our buildings. In December, there were specific buildings tested, two in Waterloo, two in Brantford, to validate the uh, information that was being received. Some minor adjustments were made to those buildings, and now continued testing has been rolled out across all other buildings. This month, the Ministry of Colleges and Universities offered the opportunity for institutions to order a select number of HEPA filter units free of charge, and we are in the process of awaiting the delivery of that order, and that is 150 units that we have requested. These units will be used to enhance air systems in rooms where central airflow has been a challenge, um, such as common areas, student lounges, some smaller meeting rooms, and also some washrooms. Next slide, please. Monitoring of open and study spaces has been a continual challenge for us over the course of the past semester. It is important to understand that we did see an extremely high compliance in classroom settings with virtually no issues whatsoever with mass compliance in the classroom setting on either campus. Brantford campus saw a very high rate of compliance in common areas, while we did have some concern on the Waterloo campus. As a result of that, we've implemented some significant steps to improve that um, compliance. And that includes stationary security officers that have been put in place with some of those identified problem areas. Science Atrium, the Concourse, the Library, Lazaridis Hall are all examples on the Waterloo campus. 
four additional security officers were hired to support the special constable team. And those are also offset by some student positions that we have referred to the Lori Safety Ambassador Program, who will continue to provide that support on evenings and weekends. And it's important to note, and we'll talk about this a little bit more on the next slide, that food may only be consumed in designated areas. Next slide. The Fresh Food Company or Dining Hall on the main campus, on the, on the Waterloo campus, sorry, that is where primarily our resident students eat, um, has been open continuously throughout the pandemic and is currently restricted to 50% seating capacity. The Terrace Food Court has been operating over the course of the month of January using our Hey Chef app, which is a free download in any of the normal uh, areas you can download, as well as starting Monday, our seating area can reopen. However, for any dine-in locations, it is we are subject to the same rules as everybody in the province of Ontario, and we need to verify vaccine status with through the Barrett by Ontario app for those specific dine-in settings. However, takeout uh, or pickup is readily available through those locations. On the Brantford campus, Golden Grounds has been open since earlier in January for takeout uh, and pickup service. And also next week, Veritas Cafe on the Waterloo campus will reopen uh, for uh, takeout service as is Wilfs. Starbucks has been open with limited hours and will increase to full hours starting next week. And we also have a plan to open additional outlets across the Waterloo campus at, in alignment with the phased reopening academic plan. Um, the next stage of reopening will start on February 7th. At the current time, all catering is on hold, uh, pending, pending any changes from the provincial government with respect to gathering limits. And we will be capturing those types of changes through our scaling framework and updating things like meetings and events. Next slide, please. As Ivan indicated in his section, any adjustments that will continually be made to non-academic student activities will be in lockstep with public health restrictions as they get changed or updated uh, through the coming weeks. Our staff are in regular contact with the specialist uh, supports that are provided to us through our public health agencies, and we will continue to make the appropriate adjustments as they are made available to us. I think that brings us to the last slide. Um, and this is just an indication through our COVID-19 resource page, which demonstrates the scaling framework. We've had this in place for about a year and a half now, and the scaling framework has approximately 12 categories down the left-hand side. And as you can see across the horizontal axis, there are four levels of control uh, that we have used across our system. So each campus is specifically identified and you can go to the um, webpage for the most up-to-date information. And this exact image on the slide was from November, but we have uh, updated the scaling framework as recent as yesterday, uh, taking into account the changes that we've talked through today. So I think, Kate, that brings us to the end of this section, and I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Dan and Dr. Deutschman and Dr. Joseph. So now we're at uh, the point in our town hall where we are going to take some questions. I can see through the Q&A feature that there's lots coming in, which is excellent. You can keep those coming. We have staff diligently working on the back end to either be able to answer you in real time or to funnel them through to our um, larger group. So before we get to our live questions, as mentioned, we are going to start with our pre-submitted questions and I'll call on each of my colleagues as we go. So to get started, uh, my first few questions are for both Dr. Vanelli and Dr. Deutschman. So while they come to join me, I, I will read through them. The first one is um, in recognition that many graduate classes have up to 40% of their grade related to their participation. What's expected uh, of students who might need to isolate and quarantine? Will they have access to the class? Um, and there, there's just great concern around um, missing class up to two classes and, and their requirement to then meet with the Dean uh, to consider removal. So um, to, to paraphrase on that one, it's what are we doing? Uh, what are students expected to do if they are required to isolate and miss multiple classes? Sure, um, I can take that one and then Douglas and I uh, will uh, tag team for any other parts that remain with it. 
uh, th th this is obviously uh, um, one of the main questions the students are asking. Uh, I'm glad you asked it first, Kate. So the approaches that you can take is really to uh, uh, currently with these courses, it, it varies but course by course. So it depends on the particular graduate course you're engaged in and what the learning objectives are in that course that your instructor in, uh, is trying to achieve and the course syllabus. So if the course uses other uh, methodologies like MyLS, et cetera, options for courses, uh, course notes, et cetera, uh, could be a, co a combination, a, a possibility as you deal with this. Nature of tests, assignments, or other parts in the grad course as other courses will be addressed. There are a number of resources to support student success at Laurier, and students are encouraged, encouraged to reach out to the expert staff at Student Success and Retention, which is in the Office of Teaching and Learning for guidance on effective approaches, ready to stay on top of your courses as this occurs. So it's really important that you engage with your instructor grad courses, unlike uh, many undergraduate courses are quite large, although they, you need to deal with them in the same way. It's important to let, work with your instructor in that course on how you can achieve the requirements of participation rates, assessments, examinations you'll be involved in. Uh, there are quite a number of details that are available from the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Retention that one could uh, achieve here. And that involves a lot of uh, also the planning, study tips, et cetera, to make sure you're also aligned to achieve this. So that's going to be all made available. So uh, Douglas, anything else you wish to add on the participation rates or anything else here? Uh, that was a, a very, a very comprehensive answer. I just wanted to reinforce that graduate students are not one thing. They're many things. We have programs that are very different. Some of them have practicum or uh, placement um, options or co-op. Some of them have people doing research in the lab. Others are cohort-based or program or project-based with small groups. So the answer is going to depend very much on the type of program you're in and, and the course you're in. And so the, the place to start is with your instructor and, uh, and move from there. But I think that uh, all of all of us are aware that that there will be challenges associated with uh, COVID-19 as we go through the term, but that the benefits of being in person are, are, are very important and that we can manage this. Thank you. Stay with me, both of you. The next couple are also for you. First one is, will there be an online option for people and students who don't want to come back? Okay, I'll take that again and I'll, I'll lead off. Um, uh, the, the course syllabus for the winter term for courses, both undergraduate and graduate, were made very clear uh, going into January that they would be in person. Of course, we, we did uh, a stop because of the month of January and stayed remote because of the health uh, considerations we wanted to make sure and a safe return to campus. So they were intended to be in person. However, in the course uh, themselves, both undergraduate and graduate, or depending on the type of courses Douglas has indicated in the previous answer, it, it's important to address this in uh, the following way. While the courses for in-person delivery cannot remain, uh, uh, usually will not, will not remain remote for the winter term, the rest of the winter term starting next week, we understand and hear the student interest in greater flexibility in our course delivery models and our faculty are interested in this and are delivering this. There is a great deal of activity across the university with instructors uh, exploring the applicability of different course delivery models, including in graduate courses and the use of e-learning technology in those courses. But it is important for all of us to remember that different course uh, delivery uh, modes serve different purposes and in-person uh, and in-person learning opportunities are vital to the educational experiences of our student. Laurier has a wonderful in-person uh, courses and programs that instructors, especially graduate courses, have designed purposely to uh, purposefully to uh, take best advantage of what in-person learning affords our students. Uh, the dynamic, organic, fluid, and interpersonal nature of that in-person environment. The immediacy of in-person and the ease with which uh, uh, that supports certain forms of teaching and learning is critical here. The ability to work together and co-create in these three dimensions to organize interactive hands-on activities responsibly and to move in the space 
of being in person to use the tools in those workplaces demonstrate this model of in-person environment having impact. That trust can deep, uh, that can feed deep engagement um, in the course concepts, the connections between the instructor and the others, uh, so important to social aspects of the learning. So the in-person classroom is the, remains the focus uh, going forward. There are some of the strengths in in-person teaching and learning and the reasons why uh, educators use them in that model. Finally, uh, mediated teaching uh, tools like what we have been, uh, what's been available in the last two years through MyLS and through web conferencing tools like Zoom have come a long way, as everyone knows, in the past two years and can really serve some of the instructional purposes and learning needs well. For example, access to core and supplementary learning materials to recorded lectures and demonstrations can really help graduate students uh, review and work through the learning uh, at their own pace. Subsequently, they can really help to fortify learning. Mediated technologies also give the instructors great options and continuity in, in instruction, inclusive teaching practices, and for meeting accessibility and flexible learning needs. So as graduate students, you can anticipate Laurier's instructors will weave in the use of e-learning uh, tools and technologies in their in-person courses that you're returning to starting next week in a range of ways tied to the nature of the courses and the teaching and then supporting your learning. So I wanted to co cover that in a comprehensive way of what is the situation, but what is truly happening on the ground, uh, instructors are using a lot of flexibility for the instruction at hand. I hope that answers the question, Kate, very thoroughly. Yes, thank you. Dr. Deutschman, you've got anything to add? I, I think um, Provost Vanelli did a great job with that. I wanted to add two things. One is that um, we've also received the other, the flip side of that question, which is why can't we have more in-person activities because it's an important and rich part of graduate learning. And so there's a, um, there's a, balance we have to achieve in between um, safety, but also accessing all of the benefits that, that we just heard about being in person. Graduate programs and are really a, a vibrant small community. Uh, learning with and from your peers is an enormously important and in fact fun part of graduate school. It's something that I think we've been missing terribly and in our, um, in our own rooms on Zoom being isolated from each other in the last a year and a half. And that's been one of the biggest concerns I've heard over and over again is that isolation is a major threat to people's well-being and, and their learning. And so in-person is a really important um, activity. And so this is not something that you, you, I would hope you would want to be, it's not something you can choose to avoid. Um, and you really, I think, should be um, excited. I hope you are, I am, about being back in person. If you have specific issues with uh, medical needs or accommodations, that's a different thing. But in general, I think um, it's very exciting to be uh, moving back to in-person. That's a great segue because our next question is also for the two of you. And it is what accommodations are being made for students who are immunocompromised or living with someone who is immunocompromised? Douglas, do you want to take that? I'd love to. Um, this hits really close to home for me. My daughter-in-law had a heart transplant at age 15 and is immunocompromised, living in Toronto. My son's in grad school there. So this is exactly what they deal with every day. I mean, universities have had to deal with students with specific um, issues um, for as long as we've been around. And so those accommodations are still available. And, and the university is working with students to make sure that they have the support they need to be successful. So if you have a specific learning disability or if you have a specific condition, then that's something you should be working with the university on in having an accommodation plan. And there are a lot of resources through teaching and learning for accommodation. Um, and uh, I think those are, are, are strong options for us. If you're uncomfortable with coming to, to class and it's just um, a discomfort, that's a, a different thing. Um, I think what we're trying to do is uh, address some of the issues about why people are uncomfortable and also emphasize how many different ways the university is working to make sure that the return to campus is safe, as safe as possible, and that we can benefit from being uh, in person. 
If I can uh, th thank you for that, Douglas. And uh, uh, if I can just add one more thing, that's very important, just on some details on what Douglas just talked about. Uh, just uh, the Office of Accessible Learning is very important here that the students get engaged and for the students who are facing this situation. While accessible learning does not support uh, remote access to instruction or exams for non disability related reasons, including the students geographic location and travel and other reasons. As always, students who with well documented or verified ver disabilities like one like this, who require accommodations for reasons of their disability to access learning environment are eligible to register for accessible learning. Accessible learning will work within the requirements of a student's documented accommodation and learning requirements of the course to advise the faculty member on the ways in which it may be possible to st support the, uh, the student's learning needs. So that's, that's exactly the follow up of uh, exactly the spirit of what Douglas just talked about in the details. Uh, you need to contact Accessible Learning to, sh to review how we can shape uh, this dealing with your situation of uh, being immune compromised or other disability that you may be dealing with. Great, many thanks to both of you. My next set of questions is for Dan. And Dan, some of these, many of these were covered in your presentation. So I think we can rapid fire through some of them together. So the first one is, how are students to eat and drink on campus if they can't do so in class? So minor clarification, students will be allowed to drink, especially have water available for them in a class. That is, that is allowed, food is not. Um, it is important then to confine our food consumption to our designated eating areas. But in the case of graduate students, which is a little bit unique from undergraduate students, many graduate students have an employment relationship with the faculty offices, which presents opportunities for them to seek out some of those spaces that can be used. They still need to maintain physical distancing in those environments, but a mask can be removed and food can be consumed in those types of pri more private spaces. Great, I'm gonna keep them rolling to you. The next one is, will students have to show proof of vaccination before entering any of the buildings? So largely the answer to that question is no, with a couple of exceptions. The Athletic Center uh, has, we've set up a separate entrance to the academic spaces on the lower level of the AC on the Waterloo campus. And those students entering to go in for academic reasons will not have to show anything. However, if you're going in to use the fitness center, as we are required to do due to provincial legislation, the same as any other fitness centers across the province, you will need to show proof of vaccination through the Verify Ontario app um, as the primary way of gaining access to that facility. The same will hold true for any of our dine-in locations. At the current time, that is the only the Fresh Food Company. Starting next week, the seating area of the Terrace Food Court. And when Veritas Cafe and Wilfs resume in-person dining, they will also require that type of proof to be used. So it's only those select circumstances where somebody would need to show proof of vaccine. Great. Will Laurier be providing students or dis somehow distributing rapid test kits? And will uh, graduate teaching assistants be supplied masks and rapid tests? So we did cover this in the presentation. So yes to the second question, graduate teaching assistants will be provided masks and access to uh, rapid test kits through their faculty offices. And as soon as we receive this next shipment of five pack rapid antigen test kits, we will be making those available for pickup on both campuses, Waterloo and, and, um, and Brantford. And there will easily be able to be made special consideration for uh, delivery of some of those to the Kitchener location. Great. There was a question that came in around whether booster shots will be available on campus. I know you did cover that. and. It's a good chance for me to remind um, everyone on the call that in the chat, there are links to, sh to shoot you to where you can book appointments within the region. Is there anything you want to add to that, Dan? Yeah, the other part of this question, Kate, I think is also about whether we will require booster shots. Mm -hmm. um, and at the current time, as indicated in the presentation, we are not changing our definition of fully vaccinated. Great. Thank you for that. 
Um, the next question is whether professors will be allowed to suggest or force students to take their masks off while engaging in person class. Definitely not. Um, you know, it is your right to keep your mask on at all times, and nobody should have you uh, force you in any way uh, to remove your mask if you're not comfortable doing so. And the only time that a mask should be removed is if somebody's actually in the instructional capacity of that class. Right. Carrying through with questions on PPE, will students be recommended or required to wear goggles or glasses or anything to protect? protect their eyes, and assuming along with their masks? So across the campus, um, we've only got a couple of situations where eye protection is prescribed. Um, that is specifically done in our dining environment where people are eating without masks on. So our employees are required as part of their PPE to have uh, eye protection. And the only other circumstance that has been common is in uh, some of the research and science labs. So other than those two specific circumstances, um, to my knowledge, those are the only ones where eye protection is required. Great. Well, you did touch on this earlier, but it, it does remain an important question. So we'll reiterate it here. Uh, if someone in the class or in school, get, in the in-person environment gets COVID, will people in the classroom be notified? I could get you to answer this question, Kate. I'm sorry, just joking. Uh, at the current time, the answer is no. The only way somebody will be uh, notified um, if they, is if they've been personally exposed um, to uh, what would be classified as a high risk setting. So if somebody's in your class and people are masked and following all the safety protocols that exist in the class, it would be very unlikely that you will ever be notified unless you've been exposed on a personal basis uh, to, the, um, to the situation. Great, thanks Dan for your time. We're gonna transition now to our live Q and A's that are being funneled to me through the Q and A um, feature. So you can keep those coming. Uh, I do want to note that there are some questions in there that are nuanced or very specific to a certain context or your own personal situation. We're going to get to as many of these as we can. If we miss your question, please, or, or we can't answer it in this short timeline, please consider sending it to coronavirusquestions at wlu.ca. That'll be put in the chat for you, where we can better triage and, and get to the specificity of your question. So for this first live question, it's for Dr. Vanelli and Dr. Deutschman. It's a double barrel question. What are we doing to counteract negative learning outcomes from transitioning from online to in-person at this point in the term mid-semester? Why choose to transition mid-semester rather than postponing to the start of next term? Tony, do you want me to start with that one? Sure, you can, and I'll follow up. Uh, sure, okay. It's it's a very good question, and and there's it's it'll depend on your program, but the the move to in person is also to support learning outcomes, and, and being in person can be a, a very rich educational experience. So delaying coming back in person has a significant potential to limit uh, or to change um, our ability to learn. And there's also, I think, a health cost and a wellness cost to not being in person. So the plan had been as soon as was safe to come back in person that we would start that. And that was uh, what we were engaged planning with starting last summer. Uh, Omicron had us take a slight detour with, with um, going remote during the time of greatest concern. But now that the conditions are improving, it's important to be coming back and uh, benefiting from being in person. And waiting till the spring semester has its other costs. And as I said, we've heard from students that, that waiting too long has been problematic for them and they feel they've missed out on a lot of what they were hoping to get out of their graduate program. And so we're trying to balance uh, coming back as soon as it's safe and also not missing out on opportunities that we would we would very much want you to have. Yeah, and, and again, just to reiterate what Douglas said, uh, at, um, when the institution made this decision, we were balancing first the safe return to campus when it would be indeed safe, as Douglas has indicated, to return to campus. And it was public health indicators of where uh, the, uh, Omicron was going, that they were providing, working with ministry, all of this factored into the decisions we made. 
Uh, and again, from the learning outcomes perspective, and for, uh, for example, the second year students who have not have had very few in-person experiences, first year students, and even the upper year students, to their learning outcomes and achieving that, that was a, certainly a key part in terms of the, uh, the decision making we looked at uh, across the board. So uh, that is how we landed on that. And uh, delaying it would have had other, other implications and costs. So that was this, that's where we landed moving uh, this forward. Thanks to both of you. My next question for Dr. Vanelli. If the majority of a class wishes to remain learning remotely and they're supported by their instructor to do so, can the class remain online? Uh, unfortunately, no. I think the uh, one has to look at the course syllabus, the outcomes that we wanted, just we've been speaking about in the course that were outlined coming into the January term, which were primarily expected to be in person. So even though we began the term uh, remotely, and I, I appreciate uh, this question very, very much, it comes up quite a bit. We want to make sure, as we've just discussed, that the in-person is the focus of where we're going because of what we committed to our, uh, our community, our students, and, our, uh, and the, ourselves going forward. So that's, that's really where, uh, where we landed with this. So that's, uh, again, I did answer this in a very uh, uh, extensive way. Uh, it doesn't mean the course is totally in person in every aspect that you're engaged with. Instructors, as I said, are using multifaceted uh, approaches, using e-learning technologies uh, and other methodologies to really have impact in the learning in a graduate course, undergraduate course, other type of professional courses uh, here at the university. So that's all in play. Uh, to allow that richness of experience. But it's not just a matter of then flipping it back or staying or the intent is to go in in person and to fill it in for the richness, as I explained earlier, of what it can bring for the learning outcomes that we want to achieve for the students in that course. That That, that is uh, how we're moving on this. Thank you. My next two questions are for Dan again. Uh, the first one's pretty quick, Dan, and just wondering if the rapid test kits will also be available for graduate students based in Brantford specifically. Definitely. Great. Okay. Um, I'm going to pitch one more to you, Dan, while I've got you here. Um, this is coming from some of our, or one of our graduate students who's been mostly in person during the pandemic for lab-based research. And they're wondering if there are any designated indoor areas, uh, particularly for when the weather's bad, um, for them to eat on campus. Y you've talked a little bit about that already. They've stated they've got um, access to kitchenettes uh, throughout the research buildings and some of the graduate study spaces, um, but it's unclear which one of those are authorized for them to use, particularly for grabbing a bite to eat. Earlier in the pandemic, um, they had access to some sort of makeshift lunch rooms uh, that had a microwave, but um, not sure what the way forward is with that. Yeah, uh, I think everything that they that this person described is still possible. Um, it's the large public spaces that we don't want people eating in at the current time. Um, and this is largely tied back to our ability to enforce the mask uh, face covering policy compliance uh, that we had challenges with. How the specific comment about a makeshift lunchroom that had been made available, I would say that's going to be something that will have to be managed at the at the department level um, and will probably be very dependent on whether that room is still available or whether that room may have been put back into circulation from a classroom academic perspective. But largely what was described in this question is still possible. It's the common space eating that is the concern. Great, thank you for that. My next question is for Dr. Joseph. What is the capacity for the fitness facility um, previous to the Omicron outbreak um, or, or surge? It was 80 people, will it be the same? It's gonna be at 50% um, capacity on both our campuses. And so we'll have all of our facilities and our operations and programs op operating. And so we look forward to welcoming you back. 
Thank you. Dr. Vanelli, I have one more for you, and uh, you've touched on this before, but since it's come up again, maybe worth a few words uh, on why Laurier is choosing to transition back to in-person right before reading week. Thank you for that question, Kate. It really uh, plays off the last answer I, I gave um, about, uh, and we've been giving consistently through this, we really wanted to make sure that the students had the opportunity uh, um, with safety protocols being met and safety requirements and a safe return to campus as Dan Dawson has indicated to assure that, that we could come back as soon as we can. Um, also because of the transitioning we will be engaged in, uh, certainly starting next week, um, if, uh, if the health conditions, the public health conditions and the safe return to campus are all there, which it is, could we do it sooner? It allows us, as we've indicated, and we answered that even earlier, how we can help students in that transition because there's ways to do that. After you get past reading week and into other uh, very intense part of the back end of the course, that would have been more challenging if that was not available. If that was available to do, of course, we would have done it. but. Doing it earlier was better in terms of what we wanted to achieve for uh, courses like, for example, next week in phase one, which have a lot of hands-on components in learning outcomes, laboratories, high-end tutorials, uh, practicums, other parts that are engaged that really require the class to do as much of that as possible, dealing with the safe uh, environment that we want to be in. So that's we chose to go. That's why we chose to go earlier. Uh, than later and before reading week to answer that question. Thank you. I saw Dr. Deutschman popped up. Would you like to add to that? Yeah, I, I would. I I just wanted to point out that that um, Laurier is actually very much in 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 lockstep with other universities throughout Ontario and throughout Canada in trying to find this place where it's safe enough to come back and get the best benefit from it. Some universities like McMaster started two weeks ago um, and are phasing in most of their classes by Monday. Others are starting next week um, in British Columbia. Simon Fraser and UBC are at odds in how they're doing it. And at every university where this has come up, there have been complaints on both sides. You're waiting too long. You're going too soon. And so it's it's not going to be possible to satisfy everyone because it's a very difficult middle road to find. And it's going to, it's going to feel different to all of us based on our personal situation. But I think that Laurier's strategy is, is very sound and very much, um, I think, in keeping with uh, the best practices we're seeing throughout the sector. Thank you to you both. And I'm going to ask you to just hold here and I'm going to invite Dan back as well. There's a number of questions in the Q&A related to um, managing a scenario of a student being ill or an, an instructor becoming ill and that rolling out. And I know we've talked about it already and there were some slides on it. And I would and so I'm gonna ask you to comment again just on what that process should look like for if a student becomes unwell and can't attend uh, their class lab or, or their uh, TA position. Similarly, what they will ex what should ex they should expect if their instructor falls ill. But before, before before you do that, you can think on that. Um, again, I encourage everyone to look in the chat. There is a link there that is specifically answering these questions with a step-by-step -step walkthrough of important context, excuse me, important contacts and steps to take to help you navigate the situation. So take a screen grab of that, bookmark it for yourself in case you need it in the coming days and weeks. Um, so with that, can I turn it over to the three of you to answer that um, again, both from the student perspective and expectations for if an instructor becomes ill? Okay, um, why don't we take it in pieces? <laughs> so uh, if, let's start with the instructor side. If an instructor becomes ill, um, uh, communication would go forward to the class and what will be occurring behind the scenes. We would look at, again, like with students, we would look at the instructor's uh, situation. If they've um, contacted COVID or indeed uh, have COVID or they have to self-isolate or they have a family member that forces the self-isolation, uh, whatever the situation may be. And then are they able to deliver the class? So in a case where the instructor cannot be in the classroom, 
we would look at the number of scenarios. Uh, there are two in mind. Uh, could an alternate instructor be found for the program to teach the course? Or B, if the instructor is asymptomatic, is managing it, that can teach, then the class would go remote for that period of isolation and then return to in-person to allow that to happen. The, those are a couple of choices to deal on the faculty side. Um, Douglas, I think on the student side, we already addressed that one with students that are identified. There is a protocol that is a step that defines step-by-step how students indicate that they may have contacted COVID, again, have to self-isolate, are not able to come into the classroom. <clears throat> Steps have been well, are provided on which forms they need to uh, um, fill in. So that, and then the faculty member is made aware that they cannot attend the course for whatever period of time. The faculty member would work with the student to make sure uh, they can accommodate they're completing the course in a timely manner if they depend, missed parts of lectures, assessments, whatever the situation may be, we will work in a very comprehensive way on that side. So I, I, I gave a shot at both. I hope that's pretty thorough on that. And Dan, I don't know uh, from the um, public health side or anything, what's a student or a faculty member, what uh, is communicated or how that's managed. So. Douglas, anything you want to add first? Oh, I did want to add one thing. We, we talk a lot about um, being ill and missing in-person activities and what that might mean. But remember, sometimes when we're ill, we can't even do online activities because we're sick enough that we can't um, think straight or we can't really get out of bed safely. We've had issues with that, you know, um, pre-COVID. So what, hap what will happen depends very much on the situation of the student. There are the public safety issues about not exposing other people to COVID. And then there are the issues about your own illness and getting healthy and working with your instructors to make sure that you miss as little as possible and um, are able to um, maintain your progress in your program. So the only small part I'll add, Kate, is that since public health in January is not requiring testing or even making testing available, public health really is not playing any direct role uh, in our environment. So it's very much up to the individual person uh, to monitor themselves and act accordingly as per the public health guidelines. One last part, I uh, uh, just want to mention to it, thank you, uh, Dan, on that one, uh, uh, Douglas. Uh, teaching and learning also does, uh, uh, this is the office of the Vice Provost Teaching and Learning, Mary Wilson. Uh, they have developed new evidence-based flexible teaching and learning resource that gives focused advice to our faculty on how to use classroom technologies to build flexible engagement to develop a classroom community and connection to bridge student absences, which is what we're talking about here, and to balance asynchronous synchronous components. So it's adjusting to the teaching, but also if students in this case are not able to come to the classroom. So that is a, a made available to the instructors. We're gonna be communicating that to faculty so that they're aware of some options that could help uh, if there's an extended absence from the class. So there's a number of ways we're, we're looking at attacking this. Right, thanks. Thanks to all of you. So we're at the end of our time um, in that there are still some questions remaining, but they're quite specific. So um, our staff on the back end are working to answer them. Um, there are also some questions that have already been answered. Uh, presumably they're from students who were a bit late to join us. And in that case, um, I'd remind everybody that in the chat feature, the, um, all of the links from today's discussion have been listed and they've actually just been added again so that you can find them really easily. Please take a photo of them, screen grab them, bookmark them. They're really, really critical that you have them at your fingertips. They have lists of supports and resources, next steps if you've got questions, and they're updated frequently. As things change, those are, are updated frequently. So we can't stress enough, a lot of work goes into making those accurate. So please use those links. Um, I want to thank you um, all for taking some time. We really acknowledge how difficult and but, you know, awkward this transition back is going to be for everybody. And so uh, we really appreciate your questions and we want to ensure you've got what you need. So if something comes up or something wasn't answered in the coming days, 
please use the coronavirus questions at wlu.ca email address to submit your questions and the, the team will work to get those answered for you. Uh, this was recorded, so the recording will be released if you want to review the presentation, um, share it with some of your colleagues, please feel free to do so. So on behalf of all of us, we want to thank you. We wish you a lot of luck in the coming days as we make this transition. Uh, and, and we really feel you play a really important part in getting the Laurier community back together again. So take care and thank you, everybody. Stay well. <laughs>